Hey, thanks. So it is, uh, uh, it is my real pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, Professor Sebastian Defner. Uh, Sebastian hails from Augsburg, Germany. Uh, he received his master's degree from the University of Augsburg. And then in 2011, he received his PhD, summa cum laude, also from the University of Augs Augsburg, working with, uh, uh, with Professor Eric Lutz. Um, uh, he, uh, Sebastian works on a number of topics broadly related to, to quantum mechanics, uh, so shortcuts to adiabaticity, quantum speed limits, and so forth. But of particular relevance for this talk, he's, he's well known for his work in quantum thermodynamics. Uh, in addition to the research itself, he, he and Steve Campbell have recently published a book, which is an introduction to the thermodynamics of quantum information. Uh, Sebastian is the recipient of the Leon Heller postdoctoral prize from Los Alamos, and the uh, uh, I should mention he was he was a, uh, a postdoc first at the University of Maryland and then at uh, and then at Los Alamos National Lab before starting a position at the the University of Maryland Baltimore County in 2016. He's also uh, uh, received the Early Career Award from the from the New Journal of Physics and something like half a dozen or more outstanding, refer uh, outstanding referee or outstanding reviewer awards. So uh, without any further delay, um, let me turn the floor over to, uh, to, to Professor Sebastian Duff. Uh, thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. And thank you very much for um, the opportunity to talk about my work in the JQI seminar. So as Chris said, um, I was a postdoc from 2011 through 14, so for three years in College Park. And during that time, I religiously went to the JQI seminar and was always very impressed by the rather prominent speakers. And now being given the opportunity to speak um, in exactly the same seminar at this venue, um, it's really humbling. Um, what I want to do today is just to give you a little bit of a broad, very, very broad, and maybe even superficial overview of uh, a couple of things that we've been working on and what I'm personally very interested in right now. So the broad um, overline, um, the broad title of my work is Thermodynamics of Quantum Information. But only recently, a couple of weeks ago, I realized that Thermodynamics of Quantum Information doesn't actually quite capture all the interesting things that we're working on. And I've been banging my head against the wall trying to come up with a better tagline. What I've now settled on is, um, uh, which you see here's a subtitle, which is thermodynamics and control of information in complex quantum systems. And what that is trying to reflect is that I'm not only interested in the thermodynamic properties of quantum information, but that I'm also thinking a lot about quantum control and this um, it, um, reflects what Chris said about quantum speed limits and shortcuts to adiabaticity. So I'm at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and this is where the money comes from. Now, the next slide I had originally taken out because obviously people in College Park know all about this. However, after I saw the um, big announcement on Twitter um, uh, with um, uh, the links to the worldwide um, live stream on YouTube um, in multiple time zones, I thought it might be a good idea um, to um, my friends and the audience um, worldwide to highlight that Maryland has at least two serious universities um, to speak of. Um, but to be a little bit more precise, Maryland has a university system of Maryland, which is very similar to what you might be familiar with in California or in Texas, where we have um, two um, large independent research universities where JQI is located in College Park and we're in Baltimore County, which is right outside Baltimore. So actually when you're sitting in the inner harbor, right um, downtown, um, Baltimore, and you're looking towards the Appalachians, and when you're looking towards west, then this is what you see. Um, this is our campus. Our well, Appalachians are somewhere back here. And the physics building is very, very easy to recognize because it's the one with the observatory. Before the world actually went totally insane, this is where you usually found me. So this is my office. Now, as we were chatting right before the talk, I actually haven't seen my office in a year. Um, I've been told that it's still there, but I'm not entirely sure in what shape. So here's just a little bit more information. So we're right outside Baltimore. Um, we are considered somewhat mid-sized. So we have about 15,000 students, which means despite the fact that we're significant, um, we're pretty small in comparison to College Park. <clears throat> Nevertheless, um, the physics department is reasonably um, broad in interests, where we have groups in the more traditional quantum things in condensed matter physics, atmospheric physics, and astrophysics. Now, it might be interesting um, uh, 
for all of you to know that I was originally hired as a quantum optician and quantum information theorist. But quickly after I arrived, I realized that with my background in statistical physics, I actually should also be in condensed matter physics, and they put me on the list here. More recently, we've also been starting thinking about um, properties um, that are more of cosmological setting, which means we're interested in the thermodynamics of black holes and the early universe, and we'll be talking about this a little bit in the later part of the talk, which is why they've now also listed me under astrophysics. And the only um, uh, discipline, subdiscipline, where they haven't listed me is atmospheric physics, but I promise you this is just a matter of time. Now, this is not um, uh, to show off or anything, but what I'm trying to, um, uh, um, uh, to say at this point already is, is that as a thermodynamicist, um, I'm really interested in a very, very um, broad range of topics and that I'm not necessarily restricted only to a specific type of question, but rather um, what we're doing in our work is using the same universal phenomenological tools that have been developed in a very, very old theory, thermodynamics, applied to many different interesting scenarios where due to the universality of the theory, we can go surprisingly far and we have surprisingly many interesting things to say about many different fields that we do not understand in depth. Now, when saying thermodynamics, um, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page because probably for most of you, thermodynamics is a class that you took um, probably last time um, as a graduate student. And um, I hope that you have pleasant memories but mostly people remember it as a horribly complicated theory that may or may not have made perfect sense. So to bring everyone on the same page, when I say thermodynamics, I really mean the old fashioned theory that was originally developed as a phenomenological framework to describe the average behavior of heat and work. Why heat and work? Well, these are the um, somewhat canonical and natural observables quantities to describe um, gadgets like uh, down here, namely steam engines. Nevertheless, and this is what I was already trying to illustrate on the previous slide, thermodynamics despite its somewhat limited um, origins, has proven to be one of the most powerful and universal theories in physics with many applications on literally all length scales. So typically we talk about um, uh, problems at somewhat the mesoscale, talking about phase transitions. But by now we also understand that thermodynamics has a lot to say about the micro scale, for example, in chemical reactions, and all the way up to um, uh, the macro scale as for instance, to describe um, the properties of cosmological objects such as, as black holes or even the universe in its, in its entirety. However, and this is also something that um, people mostly don't appreciate, in its original inception, if you say thermodynamics, you're actually lying. Because the only processes that are fully describable, let me emphasize, fully describable by means of thermodynamics are quasi-static processes that are infinitely slow successions of equilibrium states. About all real processes, thermodynamics only has to say that some amount of entropy, some amount of heat is dissipated into the environment and something, or in other words, something's lost. So the original goal of thermodynamics then was to understand how much is lost and to minimize this dissipation of um, heat into the environment to improve and optimize thermodynamic devices, steam engines. Now, when we go through all of this, and in particular, if you only take in the standard classes, what you typically think of are um, devices like this. So this is a picture that I took myself um, when I was a student in um, the Diesel Museum in Augsburg, where I'm from, a small town in, in Germany, where Rudolf Diesel um, uh, was working on his prototypes um, for the diesel engine. And this is actually the first operating fully functional prototype. Now, if you look at the thing, so this looks very much like what you would find in textbooks, namely you have um, here um, chemical engine, steam engine, doesn't really matter. <clears throat> But you also immediately see why you need a phenomenological theory to uh, describe a, such a device in its entirety. Of course, this is a classical system. So in principle, we could write down the Hamiltonian equation of motions for all the moving parts, the little bells and whistles and the wheels, but it quickly becomes very, very complicated. So even if we don't account for the working medium that is um, processed here in the cylinder, we probably have something like to 10 to the 10 differential equations that we would have to solve to fully describe the behavior of such a device which means, let's just um, digest it a little bit, we would have to deal with 10 to the 10 coupled differential equations to describe um, uh, the modes of operation of such a device. Thermodynamics does away with that by um, looking only at um, uh, the interesting, typically only three or four macroscopic variables, 
that not only describe the operation of one specific type of this engine, but a whole class of engines such that we can say something interesting and universal about these types of devices without having to solve all of these um, couple differential equations. Now, why is this important? Well, if you um, understand where thermodynamics comes from, namely the beginning of the industrial revolution where people try to understand devices such as this diesel engine, it becomes very apparent that more or less, we are pretty much in the same situation right now. Very, very um, um, frequently <laughs> over the last couple of years, big corporations and also smaller startups come up with new technologies that promise to exploit some kind of quantum advantage. And this is just a random collection of a couple of pretty pictures where you have here. So this is not Sycamore. This is the private generation of um, um, Google's um, quantum computer. You have something from Microsoft and Rigetti, and there are many more. What is important is that, of course, in principle, we could describe these systems in their entirety. We know how to do that. We just would have to write down the Schrodinger equation for all moving parts, in that case, all charge carriers. But the problem is, well, here again, we're looking at many, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 15, I don't know, particles, for which um, we then would end up with something like 10 to the 15, 10 to the 20 coupled partial differential equations. Well, in principle, we can do that, but this is exactly also the argument why we need a quantum computer, because we can solve it on a classical computer. So what quantum thermodynamics, or in my understanding, quantum thermodynamics then is aiming to do is essentially what classical thermodynamics has done for steam engines, namely to formulate universal statements that allow you to improve and understand such devices such that we minimize dissipation into the environment. And I don't have to say much about the fact that any dissipation, any coupling to the environment is going to harm the delicate nature of the quantum states, which is exactly what you want to um, harness or exploit in these devices. Sebastian, right. could I ask a question? This is Bill Phillips. Sure, Bill, go ahead. Um, so thinking back to your, your diesel engine, when you said that if we wanted to treat it completely, there would be, uh, 10 to the 10 uh, couple differential equations. I'm, I'm not quite seeing where that comes from. If, if we were talking about every molecule, it'd probably be more like 10 to the 20th. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're talking about every joint and uh, uh, you know, in that thing, it would be a lot less than 10 to the 10. So, so, so what are you thinking about when you're, when you're saying 10 to the 10? <laughs> so 10, to the 10 I really meant the um, moving parts. So um, well, you're right, it's probably just 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 um, uh, um, uh, screws or whatever here and okay. there. And there. <laughs> I was just, uh, so I was estimating, so this is the first operating diesel engine. If you walk through the museum, you see more complicated um, engines for um, ships and for tanks where you then have, I don't know, 10 cyl cylinders or a more. So I was just trying to illustrate um, that this is a complicated piece of technology that in principle we could describe um, by means of classical mechanics but there's just no way that we're going to do it. Right, but you were thinking about the macroscopic parts, not the microscopic parts. Right. But so then when you were giving, when you were telling us about what that number would be for the quantum thing, you were talking about the microscopic parts. Um, to a certain degree, yes. But microscopic parts, we also have to think about what kind of qubits we're looking at and whether we're doing error correction or which else. So I'm basically, so these numbers, um, are just um, to illustrate um, that um, uh, this big. is a complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Big. Whatever they are, they're big. <laughs> Much bigger than okay. anything we can handle. Okay, fine. Thanks. Well. <laughs> we could make that a lot more precise, but for the sake of argument, that's really not what we need here. So we just need this is complicated. <clears throat> and I promise I'm going to be more careful with numbers from here on. All right, so this is my outline for the, um, the rest of this talk. So um, I want to, obviously I won't be able to talk about everything in quantum thermodynamics. So I'm just going to pick one and only one um, concept that has proven um, reasonably successful. And I will try to illustrate how to think about um, um, in particular quantum work and of quantum work, I'm not even going to talk about all possible ways to define work, but I'm actually going to just pick one notion of quantum work that has received some prominence. And the only thing that I want you to take away from this first um, part of the talk is going to have a little picture of um, a quantum heat engine that has been built in a laboratory. 
And when you hear quantum thermodynamics, what I want you is I want you to remember um, the picture of this quantum engine, the way that you think of um, steam engines when you hear classical thermodynamics. Then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to spend some time on the project that, we're, that we've been recently working on, where we're exploiting this notion of quantum work in a somewhat more interesting scenario, where we're now really looking into um, unique and maybe even somewhat peculiar quantum phenomena, which means in particular, we're going to look into um, quantum symmetry. And I'm also going to illustrate that only with a couple of words, um, how that is related to experimental systems. And then in the last part of the talk, depending on which time we have, I'm going to briefly skim about, um, over a couple of other things that we're interested in, just to give you an idea of what my group is working on. All right. But before we talk about the quantum case, I do want to say a couple of words about the classical case, because I think it's instructive um, to understand the classical thermodynamics of small systems um, before we move to the quantum system so that you see the difference in the issues. Um, so when I was a um, master student, um, which um, I started, so I started working my master thesis, I believe, in 2007. And the very, very first paper that Eric gave me to read was this Physics Today article by Bustamante. And um, today, this is still one of my favorite articles because it made it very, very clear to me why we need to rethink thermodynamics when talking about small systems. So what you have here, this is a picture from this Physics Today article. What you have here on the y-axis is the typical rate of dissipation of a device. And here on the x-axis, you have the typical length um, scale of um, such a device. Now, something like the steam engine or on um, the diesel engine that I had a couple of slides um, ago, they live somewhere up here. So they're somewhere um, on the length scale of a meter, two meters, three meters, something like that. And um, on average, they dissipate something like to 10 to the five, 10 to the six, um, joules per second, megajoule per second. What we see here in the dashed line is one kBT per second, or in other words, very hand-wavingly, this is the amount of energy that is um, delivered by a single kick from the environment, typical um, energy that is carried by a thermal fluctuation. Now, out here, this is really what we typically call the thermodynamic limit, where from um, Think about um, the problem from a statistical physics point of view, distributions come, become sharp, and we never have to worry about any fluctuations. Now, here in this experiment from 2003, which was done only um, a few years um, before this Physics Today article was written, the first nano device was built. Now it's um, almost 20 years old, so it's not very impressive, um, except that already back then, um, they were able to build a device that did something purposefully, not anything useful but they built something that did exactly what they wanted it to do. So what you see here is um, there's a carbon nanotube. And to this carbon nanotube, um, they attached a small silica plate, which they make rotate in an AC field. So not, part not particularly useful or anything, um, but um, it does exactly um, uh, what they wanted it to do. Now this artificial um, motor, that's sitting down here. So it's somewhere between the micro and the nanometer scale, and it's pretty darn close to one kBT per second. Which means when we want to talk about the thermodynamic properties of such um, uh, um, devices, we do need to worry about the fluctuations. All of a sudden, thermal fluctuations play a huge role. Or in other words, a single kick from the environment would be sufficient to drive the system arbitrarily far away from equilibrium. Now, other systems um, that you would like to think of are, for example, single bacteria, or um, single RNA hairpins, and they all are somewhere down here, very close to the thermal fluctuations. Now, if we need um, to understand fluctuations when talking about classical systems, then quantum systems that are somewhere down here, just outside the scale, are probably going to need an even more careful treatment. Luckily, um, Chris helped us out by the discovery of um, what has been called one of the most important um, statements of um, statistical physics, which is the maximum, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, Yashinsky equality, which is the generalization of uh, the maximum work theorem. Um, I assume that all of you by now have seen this. So let me just be very, very brief on um, highlighting what I think is important about um, the theorem. <clears throat> what we immediately can read off is, is that if we want to extract equilibrium information, so, um, such as the free energy difference, 
we do need to understand the fluctuations, or in other words, we do need to understand the distribution of work values, um, which for every single realization of a process is going to be different due to the kicks that the system receives um, from the environment. Now, thinking about what that means, for example, for the diesel engine that I showed before, the diesel engine is so large that the spark distribution is essentially a delta function, which means we do not have to worry about um, um, uh, the fluctuations. However, for small systems, this distribution has a width, and this width or the fluctuations do encode interesting thermodynamic information. Um, over the years, over the last I don't know, almost 25 years, 24 to be precise, um, this Yashinsky equality, which is written up here, has been proven to be incredibly powerful and also very, very universal. In particular, it's true for slow processes, which are very close to equilibrium, but it's also true for fast processes, which are very far away from equilibrium. It can be proven to hold for closed systems, where the thermal fluctuations only come from the initial thermal state, but otherwise the system undergoes Hamiltonian dynamics. But it's also true for open systems, and for open systems, strictly speaking, I don't even need a Markovian assumption, which means um, this um, uh, theorem holds for strong coupling, weak coupling, Markovian, non-Markovian dynamics, you name it. And as I said before, it's a generalization of the maximum work theorem that you've seen um, in the standard textbook before, where it replaces an inequality of the maximum work theorem with an equality. So this is standard thermodynamics. Standard thermodynamics tells us some amount of work is lost into the environment. What Chris told us, well, we can know actually exactly how much work has been lost. We can compute that. Now, before we move to the quantum case, I want to quickly illustrate some of the conceptual pieces um, with this first experiment. Now, um, I already had that on the previous slide, on this little um, diagram, when I was talking about RNA molecules. So what was done, and um, uh, this is actually the Bustamante group, um, and Carlos gave the, so the Pi lecture a couple of years ago, um, talking exactly about these kind of experiments. So what they did was they took an RNA molecule and um, did the usual pulling experiments that you do in um, uh, biophysics. So if you pull very, very slowly, what's going to happen is, is that all these um, internal structures are going to open, which is exactly why you um, do these pulling experiments. They allow, um, this is a tool for structural analysis. Um, now, what you see here are two typical trajectories. If you pull very, very slowly, you, you pull the RNA molecule apart very, very slowly, and then you go back, re, you refold very, very, very slowly. Then what's going to happen is, is that the diagram of force times length of the molecule um, is going to fall exactly on top of each other. So you unfold here, one of these little um, uh, loops, probably this one opens, you see a little kink, and you go um, all the way up, and then you go back down, and exactly the same value of the force, the loop back closes, and you go back down. Now, if you do that fast, the situation is dramatically different because if you go very, very fast, thermal fluctuations actually cannot be um, um, re-equilibrated in the molecule, which means single fluctuations during the fast process might either help you along or slow you down, which means thermal fluctuations might kick this little loop open or it might kick it closed. And um, the way that this shows up in the trajectories is, is that for fast processes, these open uh, unfolding and refolding trajectories um, um, have this very, very distinct hysteresis. So in this experiment, you can clearly distinguish equilibrium and non-equilibrium um, 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 realizations, or in other words, you can clearly distinguish reversible and irreversible processes. Now for reversible processes, and this is an isothermal process, we know that then the work is exactly given by the free energy difference, which means we have means to measure the free energy difference. And here over there in this little diagram, I have the work against the extension. In blue, I have, sorry, in green, um, I have the measured free energy difference, which comes from these reversal trajectories. And in red, I have um, uh, the work that was optional for uh, different realizations. Just ignore the thickness of the, um, these lines. Then what you um, find is that on average, the work is always larger than the free energy difference in complete um, agreement with the second law of thermodynamics with the maximum work theorem. But then if you compute the logarithm of the average of the exponentiated work, which means if you use the Yashinsky equality to determine um, the free energy, energy difference, you see that the blue line falls exactly on top of the green line. All right. So this experiment is often presented as a verification of Chris's theorem. Well, you all know Chris, you all know the man. 
And I think it's beyond any doubt that this man is never going to make a mistake. So if um, uh, he says the theorem is true, we don't need an experiment to verify that what he's done is correct. So this is maybe not the most important part of the experiment. What I think is much more interesting about this experiment is that it actually demonstrates something that was not clear before, and that is the following. Thermodynamics is often considered as this macroscopic theory that only applies at the macro scale, especially if you talk to condensed matter theorists, um, they would never um, buy into the idea, at least if they're not familiar with um, the, um, this kind of work, that thermodynamics also has something to say about the nanoscale. What we see here is that thermodynamics very well has something to say about the nanoscale, about single small molecules. In particular, work, which is the main central quantity in thermodynamics, is still defined exactly the same way as force times displacement. Let that sink in. This is a classical system. Work is still defined as work, um, force times displacement along a single trajectory. And now we want to move to quantum systems. All right. From here on, for the remaining half, um, we will really be talking about quantum systems. And as a motivation, we will be building on what has been done on, in classical thermodynamics of small systems, what, or what has been called stochastic thermodynamics, to develop the quantum description um, of thermodynamic nanosystems, which we can uh, either br branch out into optimal quantum processes. And unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about this today, but this is what um, Chris already mentioned in the introduction, in the quantum speed limits, quantum error correction, shortcuts to adipaticity, um, all kinds of these um, uh, interesting problems. And I will be focusing a little bit more on um, how information is processed at the nanoscale, where, and here's the main motivation from the beginning, where we want to be able to say something interesting about quantum computers. <clears throat> all right, Jim. let's get started. Sebastian, maybe I could ask another uh, uh, general question. Um, mm -hmm. So if we, if we stick to what you've just told us um, about small uh, classical uh, systems, it seems to me that the, the sort of um, uh, dividing line, although you didn't say this, it seems like the dividing line of what you considered small would, one way of saying it would be, it's where Brownian motion becomes important. Now, what I'm wondering is, is that too much of a simplification of what you're telling us? Or is that, uh, is, is that describing what's, uh, uh, what's going on? Um, for the purposes of this talk, um, Brownian motion um, is a, a good example of what I'm thinking about, yes. So generally, the situation is a little bit more complicated because Brownian motion is a very special type of um, stochastic motion, but in principle, yes. So the, for the purposes of this talk, think of Brownian motion. Okay, but be careful. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> all right. Now what we want to do is, is we want to redo all of this analysis or all of these arguments for quantum systems. Well, the problem is all these nice quantities that we're interested in, in um, thermodynamics and statistical physics have to be described by operators. In particular, the energy will have to be described by the Hamiltonian operator, probability distributions become density operators, and so on and so forth. What do you learn in quantum mechanics 101 is, is that, well, operators do not commute. There are uncertainty principles and all these things. Hmm. Well, that's going to uh, make life somewhat hard. Then strictly speaking, we don't have trajectories. Well, well, you can introduce Feynman path and these kind of things. But classical trajectories in phase space are a horribly ill-defined concept in uh, quantum mechanics simply because of the uncertainty principle. But work, which is the quantity that um, the whole theory is built on, is defined along a trajectory. It's not a state function, um, which is why it has been argued that there's no work operator. Well, strictly speaking, um, what has been argued is that there's no Hermitian operator whose eigenvalues are the classical work um, observables. And this just means, well, work is very, very complicated to measure. We need to rethink um, uh, the problem of not having trajectories. Now, as I promised, I'm going to talk only about one notion of quantum work, and I'm going to keep that as simple as possible. And again, real life is much more complicated and there are many more notions of quantum work out there, but I just want to give you a flair of how to even think about the problem um, when you just get into the field. So for the purposes of um, what's going to follow, I'm going to focus on a specific type of dynamics, and that is this um, uh, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, where I now allow the potential to be driven by some external control parameter. 
the state external control parameter, think of that as the typical um, volume of the piston um, that you can play with in a standard textbook, or maybe the length of the RNA molecule, or maybe the frequency of a trap or something like that. Now the driven Schrodinger um, equation is very nice because it's a quantum equivalent of classical Hamiltonian dynamics, which means we're looking at a thermally isolated scenario. In particular, that means there's no heat bath that we have to worry about. And that means no heat is exchanged with the environment. And therefore, all changes in internal energy have to be work. Well, that makes our life um, significantly easier. Otherwise, we would have to worry about distinguishing heat and work. But I don't want to do that right now. So right now, I only want to think about scenarios where we do not have any heat. Furthermore, to keep our life as simple as possible, let me assume that the system was initially prepared in a Gibbs state, in a thermal distribution. Now we could get into a long discussion about whether or not this is actually a natural state for an isolated quantum system, on what um, circumstances an, an isolated quantum system even reaches the state of thermal equilibrium, but this is not something that I want to worry about at this point. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to assume that one way or another, I have been able to prepare a Gibbs state. And I mostly want that so that I can um, introduce thermodynamic quantities. For better, like always, it's just um, the inverse temperature. Then N well, the, um, denotes the energy eigenbasis, which I compute here at an initial value alpha naught of the external control parameter alpha t. And this is just my partition function as always. Then one notion of a quantum work that avoids having to deal with these classic trajectories has been called this two-time energy measurement approach. And this is how it goes. You prepare initially the system in this thermal Gibbs state, and then you take a projective measurement of the, um, uh, the energy. The outcome of this uh, measurement is going to be an energy eigenvalue En, which corresponds to a value of the external control parameter alpha naught. Then you let the system evolve under this time-dependent Schrodinger equation up to some uh, pre-specified time tau. And then you take a second protective uh, measurement of the energy. The outcome of this protective energy measurement is going to be an energy eigenvalue EM, which corresponds to an, um, a value of the external control parameter alpha tau. Since there's no heat, any energy uh, difference in energy has to be work. So for one realization of this protocol, the work is then given as the difference of energy eigenvalues EM minus EN, which is a trans, um, which goes from an initial energy eigenstate N to a final energy eigenstate M. Now, now, since the system was initially prepared in a density operator and it evolves under unitary dynamics, I have to take an average over the initial distribution, P and naught, which are the eigenvalues of um, the thermal Gibbs state. And I have to average over all the unitary um, transitions that the system could have taken. And this simply just denotes that this is true for um, energy spectrum that are either discrete or continuous or even mixed. And this delta function as always just picks out the um, allowed work values. All right, you can write that on. And then li literally in a two line um, derivation, you can compute um, uh, the average of e to the minus beta w. And what you find is, is a version of the quantum Yashinsky equality, which I've written in this form down here. So you find that on the right-hand side, like always, you get e to the minus beta um, uh, delta f, but the left-hand side is a little bit more complicated. So what you're looking at here is e to the minus beta w, but now written explicitly in terms of the Hamiltonians. So what you find is, is that you actually get um, the product of these two exponentials where um, the Hamiltonian here is taken in the Heisenberg picture. So why is this important? If this was a classical system, then you could just combine these two Hamiltonians in the exponent and work would be, as you would expect, just defined as difference in Hamiltonian functions at two different times. However, quantum mechanically, operators do not have to commute, which means not even the same um, operators evaluated at different times have to commute, which means typically these two Hamiltonians are not going to commute with each other. So you cannot combine these two exponentials. And this is just illustrating the work is more complicated in quantum systems than it's in classical systems. You do need to account for time ordering. You do need to account for the fact that work is not a state function. Nevertheless, uh, conceptually, you... uh, let me just finish the sentence and then I have time for your question. But nevertheless, conceptually, this is very, very simple because this is a protocol that you can give to an experimentalist and say, go ahead, do that. Take the projective measurements, build the histogram, 
and then see what you get. Yes, question. Uh, hi, uh, this is Jing Chen Zhang. Uh, I'm a graduate student. Um, so a quick question about the average of, to define the work distribution. Um, uh, so by uh, introducing the Gibbs state and uh, averaging over uh, all possible eigenvalues, are you assuming eigenstate thermalization uh, hypothesis or something? No, this is what I said on the previous slide. This is a discussion that I do not want to get into right now because um, there are many, many good reasons why a system would not reach a thermal state. What I'm doing here is I assume that the system is prepared in the skip state without worrying about too much where it comes from. And the only reason I do that is such that I can compute free energy differences. Okay, so uh, the energy con configuration does not have to be ergodic? No, I do not. This, is, this, um, this would be a very interesting conversation, but that would um, take another two hours um, to very carefully um, determine if and when and under what circumstances a system thermalizes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. All right, any other questions? What are we doing on time? No. <clears throat> All right. So this two-time energy measurement approach despite its shortcomings has been a huge success story. And in particular, you can compute this work distribution for many, many different systems, like for example, morning oscillators, many particle systems, relativistic systems, so on and so forth. Um, if you're interested in the references, we did do the homework, we put them here um, in this paper. Um, but um, the only takeaway message from this slide is you can compute things and um, many things have been done. What I find more interesting is, is that this notion of quantum work has actually led to experimental consequences, in particular, the um, uh, development of quantum heat engines. And um, this is the, um, uh, the slide that I was highlighting before. Namely, um, this is an actual picture of a quantum heat engine, where um, this is an ion trap, where the working medium is the single ion. Now for the ion trappers in the audience, you will immediately recognize that something's off about the configuration. Namely, you will see that um, uh, these rods here are at an angle. And this is um, um, purposefully designed such that the ion that sits in the side of the trap experiences effectively different um, potentials, or in other words, um, here, this is where the cylinder is compressed, and here, this is where the ion feels an expanded cylinder. Now, I could say a lot about um, where this actually comes from, but uh, it suffices to say that we were originally thinking about these kind of setups to verify the quantum Yashinsky quality, which was later than done by a Chinese group um, by my office mate, um, Haijia um, Guan, who's now at Peking University. So we shared an office in uh, College Park together. And um, rather than um, further verifying the Shinsky quality, we went in a different direction and started thinking about um, uh, heat engines. The only thing that I want to emphasize here is, so we have devices that can implement all of these ideas. And um, we now have quantum engines that we can use as test sets uh, for thermodynamic notions. Once you have the, these devices, you can compute here, for example, in, the, um, in this case, everything is analytically solvable. You can compute the work distributions and you can start hunting for quantum signatures. You can hunting for things that are different in quantum than there are in classical physics. All right. Again, this is something that was done again five years ago and over the last five years, this has completely exploded because now people are looking into all kinds of different things. As I was saying, um, uh, now we have devices that um, can be used as test beds, which means you can look into genuine quantum effects that you do not have in classical systems. So for instance, you can ask, what happens if you put more than one ion into the trap? Are there any quantum many body effects to um, consider? What happens if you squeeze the reservoirs? And these are ion traps, so you apply laser fields, you might as well apply um, squeeze light. How does the thermodynamic performance change? You can ask the question, well, what happens to the power? How is the power dependent on any quantum um, uh, reservoirs? Oh, sorry, quantum uh, resources. <coughs> and you can further push that to look into other um, uh, platforms and basically in any platform um, uh, that has been developed um, to look into quantum advantage and quantum information processing, you can build an engine. And in particular, this has been done in um, nanomechanical um, uh, um, situations for NB centers and also for transform qubits. All right, so what do we have? So we have this emerging framework that allows us to study the thermodynamics of quantum systems. It allows us to understand thermodynamic properties 
of complex systems at the quantum scale. And we've seen the first couple of experimental implementations of this novel technology. And we're now really at the forefront of discovering new interesting quantum thermodynamic signatures. But the problem is, I started out with motivating this that uh, we want to understand quantum computers and how to dis um, uh, minimize dissipation and understand how the thermodynamics of information works in these systems. Well, I haven't done any of that yet, or I haven't any, told you any of that yet. In particular, what we need to do is, is we need to quantify resources that are interesting in quantum computing. Um, and what we really need to do is, is we need to characterize thermodynamic signatures of, for example, quantum statistics or um, genuine quantum um, effects, such as um, quantum correlations, quantum entanglement, quantum coherence. Now, in the remaining, how much time do I have? Maybe 10 minutes or so. I don't want to um, uh, go through um, uh, many research projects in depth. Again, I'm just going to give you one idea that we're currently working on. And um, I want to uh, do that in close analogy to what I've been talking about um, uh, this far, which means I want to talk about engine cycles with genuine quantum resources. And I want to illustrate how this is not something that can be um, purely pursued from a theoretical point of view, but we actually need to um, keep our hands um, to the ground, which means we do need to talk um, to our um, experimental collaborators and friends to make sure that we're actually talking about things that are relevant for um, reality and technology. So the first problem that I want to talk about is um, what um, is actually spearheaded by my grad student, Nathan. And what he's interested in is now looking into these word fluctuations that I've been talking about and identifying genuine quantum signatures in these quantum fluctuations. And in particular, he has been looking at quantum symmetry. Now, when I say quantum symmetry, then what should come to mind is the following. Classically, there's basically only one type of particle, which means there's no spin. Quantum mechanically, at the very least, we have to worry about bosons and fermions. And um, I teach statistical mechanics for graduate students. And when I had just uh, finished deriving the both Einstein distribution and the Fermi Dirac distribution in class, Nathan immediately jumped up and asked, I have a question. What happens if we have a quantum heat engine that operates either with bosons or fermions? Is there any difference in thermodynamic performance? At this point, I could honestly tell him, I don't know. Why don't you find out? So what do you think? What is better, bosons or fermions? Oh, it's already here on the slide. In literally every single um, uh, characteristic of performance that we um, uh, could look at, we found that bosons outperform fermions. So if you ever want to buy a quantum car, and I'm not kidding, there was a um, uh, paper on the archive of a couple of years ago, which literally in the title only had a quantum car. So if you want to buy a quantum car, then you want to make sure that it has a bosonic engine. Bosons always outperform fermions. And the reason why that is, is that um, due to the Fermi exclusion principle, fermions resist the compression more than what you gain um, in um, uh, the expansion. Therefore- So um, this, is a, this is a statement about a, a, a traditional heat engine with an, driven by a, a heat and an expanding gas, a sort of a piston exactly. model? Yep, exactly. So it, it's exactly actually the model that I just showed you before um, with the ion trap, except that you put um, two ions instead of one. Um, so you're right, and this is actually uh, alluding to an interesting fact. What we haven't done yet is we haven't thought of a cycle yet that um, ad, um, exploits the quantum symmetry directly. So we haven't built a quantum information engine yet, which is something on um, the to-do list. But before we did that, um, we realized, well, both of the fermions are cute, but there's this whole zoo of other particles in between, which have been called anions. And is there any thermodynamic signature of um, anionic statistics um, in the thermodynamic performance? So in brief, um, introduction to anions. So what you um, do in a modern physics class is you introduce bosons and fermions, a symmetric and anti-symmetric um, combination of wave functions. For anions, you get an arbitrary phase. So for, uh, for bosons, you just get a plus, for fermions, you get a minus, and for anions, you get an um, arbitrary phase, which can be, for example, um, realized in entangled photon pairs. So how does that work? And this is now really the part for the experts where I'm going a little bit faster because probably only a small fraction of the audience um, really knows what I'm talking about. So in quantum optics, there's the so-called hongo mendel effect, which has been used to demonstrate that um, with entangled photon pairs, you can create effectively fermionic um, uh, behavior. The way that this works is, is that you create, create entangled um, photon pairs 
Entangled photon pairs are described by Bell states, of which are three are even and one is odd. If you have an incident on a beam splitter, then depending on the symmetry of the Bell state, you either get um, destructive or destructive interference, which is illustrated over here. And the odd Bell state can be used to create effectively um, fermionic behavior, very, very um, hand waving, very superficially. Then um, if you wanted to create anions, everything that you need to do is this. You need to send many, many, many um, entangled photon pairs on, on the beam splitter. And um, uh, the um, outgoing effective statistics is going to be anionic. Or in other words, um, if you send many entangled photon pairs, um, the outgoing statistics behaves as if you had um, incident anions. And this is something that is very, very easy to implement in quantum optics. And in part, this already has been done. But looking at this now, um, now we have a um, very, very close experimental system, which is a perfect test bed to analyze this thermodynamics of symmetry. And what we've done is, well, when we started talking about anions, uh, we realized that these kind of anions have many of the appealing properties of abelian anions. We don't even have non-abelian anions um, to compare, but, um, it's just compared to the abelian anions, but that they're also somewhat more simplistic. This is a slide for the experts. So you know, topological anions are um, of the break group. And that means since they're two-dimensional excitations, it does matter um, um, how you exchange in two dimensions. Um, if you exchange once clockwise, um, if you um, want to exchange back, you can either um, uh, keep rotating clockwise or you go like counterclockwise. And whether you um, uh, rotate clockwise and then counterclockwise or um, clockwise and then clockwise again. So, so clockwise, 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 counterclockwise gives you a different um, phase statistics. These statistical anions are actually much closer to um, how they internalize the exclusion principle anions, where you do not have um, um, this additional phase from changing back. So you always go back to the exact um, original state, which means um, things like non-abelian statistical anions probably wouldn't exist. So these are probably not good particles to build your quantum computer on. But nevertheless, um, what we found is that um, these generalized exclusion um, principle anions can be tuned such that, became, uh, that's, that they become thermodynamically equivalent to topological anions. Why is this important? Topologically, uh, topological anions are just incredibly hard to find an experiment. But if you want to find them, at the very least, you need to have, know where to look thermodynamically. And statistical anions um, provide a crutch by um, uh, allowing you to study the thermodynamic properties of these systems first, and then make a prediction where in the thermodynamic state space you should be looking for these topological anions. And this is what we just recently wrote up. Now, this is something um, uh, that we're also pursuing experimentally with our, our friend and collaborator, Fabian Menges, who just started um, a new group in Dresden. So this is the Max Planck Institute for um, Chemical Physical Solids. And, um, um, his system is based on surface plasmons. So you have incident photon pairs, which go onto um, uh, this AFM tip with a grating. Then surface plasmons are just waves that um, travel down this tip here. And these waves, these surface plasmons, do carry exactly the statistics of the incident anions. Or in other words, if you send many, many of um, these entangled photon pairs, you will create effective um, um, anionic plasmons, which you then can use for your thermodynamic analysis. All right, now in the remaining, how much time do you have? Two minutes, maybe? Um, I just want to give you an idea of all the other cool things that we're working on. So I promised that I will be talking about black holes. So you all know this picture. And um, as I was saying, um, thermodynamics is not only limited to small systems, but also to, um, we can also describe cosmological objects. And in particular, the question that we're interested in is um, the um, information paradox. Or in other words, we're interested in the fate of information um, that drops beyond the event horizon. And I've actually gotten into an interesting um, argument with Peter Shore on Twitter about whether or not quantum mechanics uh, breaks down beyond the event horizon. And I don't think that um, we have ever finished this argument. Maybe we should go back to that. One um, possible resolution to this quantum information paradox has been suggested by Prescott, um, who um, called that um, information scrambling. So his idea was any information that um, transverses the event horizon is instantaneously and chaotically scrambled across the entirety of the event horizon. And if you just waited long enough, which means if you could intercept the Hawking radiation since the beginning of time, 
that would allow you to reconstruct all information that um, fell into the black hole. Um, this nicely illustrates that any information falling into the um, black hole um, is lost um, to any local observer, but that quantum information theory uh, can actually um, um, provide a way out. Now, quantum information scrambling from a thermodynamic um, point of view, this is interesting because we're talking now about the growth of a quantum resource, quantum entanglement, and we're talking about quantum chaos. And I'm sorry, but I forgot the student's name who earlier asked about ergodic systems. So this is something where we could talk more about this because um, here in this problem, we are now really asking for the thermodynamic properties of a quantum chaotic system. Now, unfortunately, um, it's, uh, it's really a pity. I don't have time to talk about all the cool things that Akram is working on, but um, what he's after is really trying to understand thermodynamics of information scrambling, formulating statements of the second law of thermodynamics, such that we can say something universally. This is something that we've just done recently in two um, papers, one last year and one earlier this year, which then also um, leads directly into more um, uh, fundamental questions such as how does classicality even emerge? Um, a thermal state is probably the most classical thing um, that you can imagine where everything has decohered. If quantum chaos is um, one of the driving forces of thermalization, somewhere the, um, some interesting thermodynamics must be happening. And you also can um, quantify that in terms of what has been dubbed ergotropy, which in other words, is just the um, maximum amount of work. That brings me to the end of my talk. I just want to flash up a few more keywords to give you uh, an idea of all the cool things that I should have been talking about, but I couldn't. In particular, I could have been talking more about uncertain relations, which means I could have been talking about speed limits and thermometry. I could have been talking more about foundations of a statistical mechanics. I could have been talking about thermodynamically optimal processes. I haven't said anything about optimization, so I've only been talking about um, where these quantum resources might be hidden, but I haven't said anything how to actually minimize dissipation that I promised in the beginning. And I had to put this bullet on because Charles used um, the picture from um, this paper on Twitter, uh, um, which is a completely new idea where we've now been um, channelizing some of these control techniques that we've developed in quantum mechanical and quantum thermodynamics to say something interesting in evolutionary biology. So please do me a favor and ask me a question about this so that I can tell you about it. All right. I understand that um, what I told you over the last 52 minutes was a lot, and I'm pretty sure that you're not going to uh, retain most of it. However, if you forget everything, that's perfectly fine with me, as long as you remember three things. One is quantum thermodynamics is alive. It's not something that people um, should have done 150 years ago, and there are no more open, interesting problems. Rather, we are really at the verge of an explosion of new findings. So it's a modern vivid field with many open questions. The research that we're doing ranges from um, uh, basically everything that you can imagine. You can go from quantum technologies all the way up to black holes, which is completely inspired of thermodynamics. And if you want to think about new, um, maybe somewhat unexplored experimental platforms, there um, are these plasmonic systems and quantum optics where we're going to do a lot of interesting things. This is um, the team. So these are the people that actually do all the work. And this is a picture that we took in October um, 19, which is <clears throat> right before the world went totally crazy. And that brings me to the end. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, and with that, the floor is open for questions. Uh, Sebastian, this is Charles. I'd like to follow up on your mm -hmm. remark about the difference between bosons and fermions when used in a, in a heat engine. In Einstein's first publication, what we now call Bose-Einstein condensation, right. he described the phenomenon in a rather different way than is that we do today. And what he said was for a, an ideal gas at any temperature, there's a saturation density such that if you, if you compress the gas, because uh, you can always compress, if you compress the gas, you'll hit a density beyond which uh, the, the gas starts to condense. He said all, all, all molecules that, um, as you increase the density, suddenly you just put a large number of molecules into the ground state of the system. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's been a, 
a simple uh, investigation of the thermodynamics of a you know, simple heat engine that, uh, that, sh that shows directly the effects of the formation of the condensate and how that, how that um, uh, changes the performance with respect to a, you know, traditional uh, ideal gas type of heat engine. To the very best of my knowledge, which might be very, very limited, um, uh, there was a paper in Quantum from um, two years ago coming out of the group by Gershon Koritsky in Israel, um, who used um, uh, the BEC transition, um, or actually the other way around, they used um, an auto refrigerator cycle as a um, tool for diagnostics of BEC transitions. Um, so basically what that is, they looked into um, the performance of such a refrigerator and asked whether there are any signatures of the phase transition. And what you would find is, is, is that um, you would find um, the usual kinky behavior in the fluctuations. Kinky behavior means phase transitions are always um, characterized by some divergence or of a derivative or um, um, something in the response function. And they showed that in the work fluctuations for this refrigerator, they do find signatures. But beyond that, the question that you are asking whether um, there's, um, and that's pr turning the problem around in using um, the BEC um, or the um, BEC phase transition as a potential thermodynamic resource. It's not something that we've done yet. The best that I can promise you, stay tuned. It's in Nathan's PhD proposal and he's supposed to do that so that he can graduate. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. But we, we haven't done it yet, so. <laughs> Uh, I have a question, uh, Paul Julian, and this will be a follow-up, I think, on one of the questions you were fishing for. But uh, of course, when I think of thermodynamics and quantum chaos and things like that, I, I think of chemical reactions. And a lot of work's being done now, actually, with reactivity of coal systems and coal molecules. The question is, chemical reaction theory was developed many, many years ago thermodynamically. I mean, over a half century ago, people like Iring and Pagliani and others, and... Uh, and you can get very complex uh, phenomena. We know how to put things in differential equations, but yet it's impossible to do an S matrix theory of chemical reactions. So you got to solve a lot of differential equations, but yet in the early way of doing it by iring thermodynamically is, you know, you, you need something that's somewhere between doing differential equations and doing it thermodynamically. So do these ideas you have have some merit? You mentioned biology. So has anyone thinking about reactivity and chemical reactions and those kind of things in terms of these ideas you're developing? Um, as far as I know, yes. So um, most of the stochastic thermodynamics was really undeveloped original for classical systems. <clears throat> so I don't think that um, quantum chemistry has quite arrived yet because I um, don't think that it's outside chemistry, many people really know what quantum chemistry is. Um, but there are at least a couple of groups in Europe, um, like Massimiliano Esposito has done a lot of work on chemical reaction networks and also um, well, Gaspar is um, now retired, but yeah, there were there are people that are looking in these things. I personally am not an expert, so I only know that it exists. Okay, you mentioned biology. What did you have in mind there? So what we did here was, um, so here we really, uh, again, turned the problem on its head. Um, there are all these um, control <laughs> tools and mechanisms um, and ideas that came out of quantum thermodynamic considerations. And they've mostly been used um, in therm quantum thermodynamic setups or in quantum informational setups where you're interested in, for example, achieving a specific quantum target state. The question that we asked was, can we use the, the same mathematical framework to drive biological reaction networks towards a um, desired outcome? And um, what we showed in this paper is that, well, um, that work, math works out was um, not that ex uh, interesting and exciting, that was pretty straightforward. But what um, we showed in this paper is that there are a bunch of um, interesting biological scenarios in which these quantum control strategies um, uh, can be applied and actually give you experimentally tested for um, predictions. Or in other words, so think for example, the following. you have um, uh, some reaction at work, you have some input, some output. Along the way, you have to think about some pathway. The way that you would do that in experiment is that um, you have to pour in some concentrations to drive the reaction from input to output. Now, what we can tell you is what is the sequence and the amount of concentrations of the outside reactants that you have to add such that um, you achieve the desired outcome in minimal time and with certainty. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Sebastian, this is Bill Phillips again. Um, I'd like to return to the Hungo Mandel uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the talk. Now, um, normally when I think of Hungo Mandel, um, I don't need entanglement to see the Hungo Mandel effect. All I need is uh, indistinguishability. I can make two photons that are the same from two independent sources, push the buttons at the same time, so the photons arrive at the beam splitter, and I'm going to see the, uh, the Hungo Mandel effect, that is the coalescence, that is I, I only get um, photons out into the same port, never one on each port. If I did the same experiment with boltsons, then uh, I'd get half the time they, they would go into a single port and half the time you'd have one on each port. Um, if I did them with fermions, then I'd always get one on each port. And that's what you were saying. You could reproduce that fermionic like behavior by doing the right kind of entanglement. And that's the thing that I was missing was because I don't think of entanglement as being part of the Hummel Mandel effect. So could you say a little bit more about that? So um, uh, this just um, is a direct consequence of um, uh, the Bell states. So the Bell states are, um, three of the Bell states are even and one of the Bell states are odd. Yeah. Now, um, uh, what you need to think about is, is the effective um, uh, interference um, of the outgoing uh, going beam. And what you would find is, is that, um, I always mess it up. The even states are going to give you destructive interference and the odd state gives you constructive interference. Uh, or is this the other way around? But yeah, but, but this is essentially the answer. So um, uh, due to the symmetry of um, the Bell states, you get um, a difference in um, interference, either destructive or um, constructive, which allows you to um, uh, do, um, uh, mimic the coalescence that you just described. So um, the odd state um, play the role of the ingoing fermions and the even state play the role of the ingoing bosons. Okay, so maybe, maybe what I've missed here is that you're adding to the usual Hummel Mandel thing, another degree of freedom, like the polarization of the uh, photons. Is that yeah. the idea? Okay, okay, fine. Now I got it. <laughs> yeah, I thought that this was what you were thinking about, then I wasn't entirely sure. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. okay. <laughs> I've got it now. <laughs> so we actually have a question from the YouTube channel. So this was asked by Ravi Minas and He's asking, how would you see a principle such as Landauer's principle? Um, what, what do you mean? How do I see Landauer's principle? Maybe the question is asking, whether whether Landauer's principle is different in the quantum case than in the classical case? I'm not sure, I don't mm. see the question. Um, okay, uh, the best I can say is, um, there's, uh, I just put a recent paper on the archive on a um, truly quantum version of um, Landauer's principle. So the problem that I see with Landauer's principle is, is that um, it's typically formulated for systems at finite temperature. Um, which we don't typically want, in particular in quantum technologies. And um, what I did in this recent uh, paper that I have on the archive is, is that I derived something that looks like a quantum um, Landau's principle, but entirely in terms of the metric properties of the Hamiltonian. I'm not sure if that answers the question because I'm not entirely sure what the question is about. But um, everything kind of that I can say is yeah, Landau's principle is important but um, there are also still many open questions and we're still working on trying to better understand um, how to get that right. And three weeks ago, I put a little paper on the archive that might be interesting in that context. Uh, hi, Sebastian, I have a question. Uh, I think following up on, on the question that was asked on YouTube, uh, this is Shubhayan, I am a PhD student. Uh, and the question is that uh, in terms of the, the measurement of energy, uh, like the quantum work definition which depends on the measurement of energy, uh, mm -hmm. or two time measurement of energy. 
so if i if i wanted to consider the thermodynamic system including the measurement uh, record will that have any effect like ala landor like because we will have some entropy associated with that information and will uh, there be a involved with, or a heat involved with in that context uh yes so things become significantly more complicated and so as i said here i presented the simplest um scenario where we can talk about quantum thermodynamics and that is we have only um a time dependent schrodinger equation if you want to keep a record or um if you want to think about measurements of the environment um under thermal contact or if you even want to think about a completely different notion of quantum work I can think on the top of my head of probably 15 to 20 different notions on different scenarios that are all interesting. And um, the best that I really can say is we put a lot of them in here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll take a look. So unfortunately, I, so I'd love to talk more about um, the problem that you're asking, but it's a very, very detailed question. And it would probably take about half an hour just to walk you through different notions and different subtleties of different um, our, um, our work. Um, so the best I can say is this, um, I can refer you to the literature and then if you have more specific questions about specific scenarios, um, then I'd be happy to follow up. Thanks. Yeah.